All right, what is going on, everybody? How you doing? Welcome to another episode of Talking Buffalo, your weekday daily driver for Buffalo sports talk and more. I am your host, Patrick Moran. Thank you very, very much, as always, for locking in. Whether you're listening to us, an audio podcast form, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast from, or whether you're checking us out on the video side via YouTube. Appreciate you very much. I also appreciate today's presenter of this show, Imperial Pizza, two locations, Abbott Road in South Buffalo, Main Street in Buffalo. Great food, some of the best in Western New York. And if you don't already know that, you certainly should. It's good to have you today. This is going to be a Fan Friday episode here of Talking Buffalo. Been doing these a little bit eh, sporadically, not every week, but uh, more than just like once a month or so. Anyway, this is an opportunity where I give people who watch or listen to the show or follow me on Twitter, friends on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, to either tweet at me, Facebook me, email me your questions and comments, and I would feature some of them on the show today. That's what we're going to do. Again, this is Friday. Well, at least on the audio side when it's dropping. This is Friday anyway. Some of you might be checking this video out sometime uh, late Thursday night. Anyway, interested in knowing how you're feeling about this game, Bills Mafia. Where are you at right now? We're at Friday, getting into the weekend, shitty weather on the way. And I want to know how you feel about this game right now. So if you're watching this on YouTube, leave a leave a comment. Make sure you like and subscribe as well. Helps us continue uh, to grow the show. Anyway, like I said, I got a, a handful of Pretty good questions that I want to get to today between uh, the Buffalo Bills. I think there's a hockey question in there somewhere. A couple fun pop culture questions that uh, I'll get to as well. Two things, though, before I get into your questions, there's two things, two topics quickly that I wanted to hit on that have really uh, bothered me over the last 24 hours or so. And one of them involves Miami Dolphins linebacker uh, Jerome Baker. And I've been sitting here for a while now, before the game, before this game on Sunday, that, of course, the Bills won to win their fourth consecutive AFC East and secure uh, the, a 2 seed for the playoffs. But I've been just been getting my mind for the last handful of years, and I know it's primarily Josh Allen, of course. But just besides that, it's like, what are some of the other differences besides Josh Allen that separate the Bills from the Dolphins? Is it scheme? Is it? the players is it coaching is it the culture and i haven't really been able to to put my finger on it again other than the the obvious fact that the bills have josh allen and the miami dolphins do not but that aside and then i saw a tweet midweek from miami linebacker jerome baker all right so now look if you if you're not living under a rock. You already know the Bills beat Miami on Sunday night. And I'm sure if you're listening to this podcast, I'm quite confident you watch the game. And right before the end of the first half, on literally the last play of the first half, Josh Allen threw a pass short of the end zone to Ty Johnson, who tried to take it upfield and get into the end zone. Uh, he was met there by Miami linebacker Jerome Baker, among others. And Jerome Baker... Hit him high, should have been a penalty, got away with it. But anyway, bottom line, no penalty on the play. Stops Ty Johnson short of the goal line. The Bills go into the locker room with no points on the board. At the time, it was, if you're a Bills fan anyway, infuriating. Uh, Sean McDermott called out Josh Allen on national TV during his little uh, sideline report hit. Said he's got to throw the ball in the end zone. He was 100% right, by the way. But my point is this, the Bills righted the ship. The Bills won the football game. That's all that matters at the end of the day. Yet that doesn't stop Jerome Baker from putting out a very, in my opinion, selfish, individualistic tweet. And in that tweet, he says, and if you're watching on the video set, I just pulled it up. He says, access denied. And it's four different Shots of that play of Baker hitting Ty Johnson and stopping him short of the goal line. And first of all, again, I mean, even in the replay, you could see his helmet and then his shoulder clearly hits Ty
Ty Johnson. Should have been a penalty. But that's not even the point. My point is, access denied with an exclamation point. You look at that, you would think that's a big play of the game that propelled Miami to a victory. Well, it didn't propel them to any victory. And that's just, I, I think about Buffalo. And I'm like, if that were the Bills and the Bills lost that football game, I just can't picture Terrell Bernard or Matt Milano or even Tyrell Dodson, who likes to talk some shit. He's very animated on the football field. And I like that during the game. But you lose a game, a critical game in your house in prime time, and you're tweeting about an individual play and celebrating something that you made. A play, by the way, that again, A, should have been a penalty, and B, you quite literally gave that player a concussion with a high hit. Ty Johnson might not even play this week. As we tape this on Thursday, he's still in a red non-contact jersey and has not cleared concussion protocol. So congratulations on getting away with a penalty and injuring a player in the process. And it just, again, it just, I keep thinking about it. That's the difference between a coach like McDaniel in Miami and Sean McDermott in Buffalo. And say what you will about Sean. And by the way, there's a question coming up here in a little bit. Focus on Sean McDermott. Sean ain't having that shit, man. It's just not going to happen. Not in a loss. Again, if that was a big play that helped win you a football game, talk your shit, man. I'm all about players talking shit. But you lost. You lost. You committed a, what should have been a penalty, and you hurt someone. And that's what you're saying access denied. By the way, the same player that hurt his wrist and is going to have surgery and is done for the playoffs. And that's kind of like, I watch that HBO Hard Knocks, which I haven't watched an episode all season, the end season with the Miami Dolphins. I watched it this week. And again, I think I got a question, so I'll kind of save some of it for when I get to that question. But concerning Jerome Baker specifically, he was featured on this latest episode, which I watched because it featured uh, the Bills game. And Jerome Baker was coming off an injury. I don't remember what it was anymore, but worked his ass off to get on the field. They showed him rehabbing. They showed his mother in the stands throughout the game. Wonderful woman. Loved her. And I didn't even have a, a big problem with Jerome Baker. I didn't even know he played, except for the fact that I'm a Bills fan. He plays for Miami, but whatever. And after the game, you know, they show him. He had uh, Drew Ozenhouse as his agent, tells the mom that he's got to have surgery, et cetera, et cetera. Like, so you got hurt, you lost the game, you're done for the season, and you're fucking talking shit that you stopped a player with a high hit and that you hurt close to the goal line at the end of the first half. That's just, it's big brother versus little brother shit. That's the way I look at the Bills of Miami at this point. And again, it's beyond just Josh Allen. The Bills are big brother, the Miami Dolphins are little brother. You look at that roster, which is, you know, ridden hard right now with injuries. That's undeniable. And so many injuries that they had on Sunday, guys like Howard and Waddle and Moser not being able to play, of course, that was huge. But you know what? The Bills have been owning this team for a couple of years now. So it's not even just that game. They would have found a way to lose. That's what I'm saying. There's no grinding in them. There's no confidence in the Miami Dolphins. Anyway, I just thought that tweet was whack as hell. I thought that shit was whack. And uh, Jerome Baker, maybe you should be tweeting about something else, you know not talking shit about a play, individual play that you made, a dirty play to, to save points at the time when your team lost a damn game, you hurt someone else, and you got hurt later in the game. Just freaking stupid. And speaking of stupid, the other thing that I wanted to hit on, look, Bill's Mafia runs deep. This is probably, and I, I only say probably because I don't intimately know 31 other fan bases around the NFL, but it sure seems like, boy, oh boy, this Bills Mafia is the most passionate fan base in, in football, maybe all the sports. I love that about Bills Mafia. Respect it. I love how when the Bills go on the road, they're so well represented. I mean, last week in that stadium, maybe my second favorite thing last week about Deontay Hardy returning that punt for a touchdown, my first favorite thing being obviously, of course, that it tied the game and completely swung the momentum. My second thing is when you listen to the audio, the crowd, Half that stadium was erupted with chairs because Bill's Mafia was so represented. Anyway, I love that about Bill's Mafia. Wherever you go, 
Pittsburgh, Washington, Florida, L.A., you name it. It doesn't matter. Bill's Mafia is showing up and they're represented. Bill's backer parties. The whole nine. It's awesome. Sometimes they literally take over a town. And I really think that's cool. But you know what's not freaking cool? Other teams have fans too. And they come to Buffalo. And they party it up just like Bill's fans do. Maybe not as many. Maybe not to that extreme. But they do. And the Steelers are coming to town this weekend. Well, barring a national uh, or a, a state of emergency because of the weather, they're coming to town anyway this weekend. And they want to party, man. They want to party. And there is a Pittsburgh Steelers uh, backer club. It's a Road Warriors playoff party being advertised for Buffalo River Works downtown, that huge bar downtown. Saturday, this Saturday, tomorrow, from six to nine. And there's been some flyers and shit, you know, going around social media. And I've seen with my own eyes and heard about others, Twitter, even my Facebook, with people that I know a couple people that are actually threatening to boycott Buffalo River Works because they are playing host to a party for the opposition's fans. Seriously. That shit, if you right now are watching the show, and I'm talking directly to all of you, if you're watching the show, if you're listening to this show, and you are a frequenter of Buffalo River Works downtown, and you have made a decision that because they are hosting a, a tailgate party, a backers party, whatever you want to call it for Steeler fans coming into Buffalo this weekend, and you have decided that you're going to boycott that bar because of that, you are a scrub. You are a loser, a scrub, a bum, whatever you want to call it. That shit is as whack as it gets. I <laughs> Come on, man. Road games for fans are fun. You know, I have fun with fans of the other team. Whether it's going on the road for a game, which to be fair, I really ever, ever, ever do. But I lived in Florida for five years. Every game, Bill's game for me was a road game because there's fans from all teams in Florida. It's a transplant state. But anyway, whether you go on the road and you uh, associate with, with, with fans of that stadium or that team, or whether they come to your house, the banter, the shit talking, drinking, eating. It's all fun, baby. It's all fun. It's supposed to be fun anyway. And then again, then you got your bums and your scrubs who are going to take it so literal and so serious that you're actually going to boycott a bar because fans of the other team want to come and fucking have a good time before they go to Highmark Stadium on Sunday. That is some of the wackest, sorriest ass shit that I've ever heard in my life, which by the way, the bar, whether it's Riverworks, whether it's whatever bar that hosts whatever background, whatever given weekend, that is a bar or a restaurant or a place of business that has local employees who live here, people who are depending on money to put food on their table, to take care of themselves, to take care of others. And you're going to go and you're going to boycott a bar because they're hosting a party for fans of another team get the fuck out of here man what is that sickening it makes me sick it's football this is fun go to go to riverworks go talk some shit to Steeler fans go have a laugh with them go do shots go tell them their team sucks talk a little trash you gonna go boycott the business <laughs> it's pathetic, man. This isn't war. This isn't the Axis versus the Allies. This isn't the Civil War. This isn't North versus South. It's a fucking football game. And fans of other teams are coming into our town to have some fun. And you're going to punish? And by you, I mean probably not you. 
I'm talking about a very small, minuscule percentage, but there are actually people out there talking this shit, saying it, and they're not joking either. I've seen a few of them on Twitter with my own eyes. And you're going to punish a bar, boycott a bar, because they're going to host fans of another team. That is some sorry-ass, pathetic shit, man. It does not get any worse than that. You know, I personally, I don't know them personally, but I personally know of at least one organization here in Buffalo that literally goes to every single road game. And they set up parties at other bars in other cities. You know, just recently we saw a million pictures. I think it was the Elbow Room in Miami or near Miami. I'm not quite sure exactly even where it is. But that's just an example. Bill's Mafia Takeover. If you went there, if you went to Miami or if you went to Nashville, or any of these road trips, LA, and you went to a bar and that bar decided that they were not going to, you know, local areas, or I'm sorry, local residents are deciding that they're not going to frequent that place anymore because your ass came in there and have a good time for a couple hours once. If you don't think that's fucked up with some sorry shit, then you're the problem. Then you're the problem because that is utterly, utterly ridiculous, man. I just, I, I can't believe this is even a conversation being had. I can't believe that people are actually going to boycott a place. I'm going to, you know, I don't go to Riverworks, but it sure as shit ain't going to be because, well, I shouldn't say that. I don't go to Riverworks often, but it sure as hell ain't going to be because they're having some Pittsburgh Steelers fans throw themselves a party to get themselves fired up for a football game that they're probably going to get their asses whooped on anyway come Sunday. I ain't going to be going to Riverworks because I can't afford that shit. Those fucking prices for beers and drinks there, you need like a third mortgage to be able to afford it. That's why I ain't going there, but not because there's going to be a Steelers fans there having a backers party. Get the fuck out of here with that shit. Anyway, real quick break, and then I'm going to start running through uh, these questions. So pretty good ones that you got right after this break. All right, I'm back here, Fan Friday, about to get to some questions. And man, I just realized, going into that break, I kind of got myself fired up. But seriously, man, think about that. Think about not going to a bar or a restaurant anymore that you otherwise have went to or that you otherwise would continue to go to strictly because that place is hosting a party. Which, by the way, in January, which is the slowest bar and restaurant month anywhere in the country of the whole year, January. And you're going to be that pissed off, that triggered because of it. You're, you're Again, you're a bum and you're a loser if that's the reason why you're not going to go to any places like that anymore. Anyway, all right, let's jump into some of these questions. Uh, I got a good handful of them here. Won't take up a lot of time. Uh, Jenna wants to know, what scares you most about Pittsburgh? Something has to. Uh, two things. The first has nothing to do with Mother Nature. I'll give Pittsburgh credit for one thing, physicality. You know, physicality might be something that concerns me a little bit. Pittsburgh is a very physical team, and the Bills just played a very soft football team. And that's not me even taking shots at Miami. Miami's a very good football team, but they're a finesse team. Miami doesn't have that grind. They don't got that dog in them. They're not willing to, to, to fight like animals in the trenches. Pittsburgh is. So the physicality is always going to be something about when you when you think of the Pittsburgh Steelers. The physicality is something you got to be concerned about. If you're not up to the task to be physical, Pittsburgh could get the best of you. So that's the one thing, but not a big deal because I'm confident that the Bills are going to be a, a physical in their own right too. So that's not that big of a deal, but it's the weather, man. It's the weather. The weather, honestly, at least to some extent, has kind of changed my mind about this game as a... Uh, the week is worn on. If you listen to the show or watch the show regularly, I was begging, and I still am glad it worked out this way, by the way, but I was begging for things to play out over the weekend that Pittsburgh would be the team coming to Orchard Park, and that's exactly how it played out. Now, I haven't gotten off that whatsoever, but I felt extremely confident. Uh, my, my partner on my Monday night tapings, Tone Pucks, refused to even discuss the Steelers. He was just straight to Kansas City in the divisional round, even though the Bills haven't played Pittsburgh. Not to mention Kansas City hasn't even played Miami yet, but that's what Tone Pucks was all about. But anyway, still confident, 
Even on yesterday's show, which was taped early Wednesday morning with Anthony Marino from Rumblings, he predicted a, a much closer game. I predicted the Bills to win 30 to 12. And then by the time we went off the air, I changed it, revised it on the air. And I said, you know what, Ant? I've changed my mind. It's going to be 37 to 12. So I've been extremely confident in the Bills all week long. But the weather scares me because we're hearing things as I'm taping this uh, mid afternoon on Thursday that this weather could be really, really bad. Snow, cold, wind. Now, the first two things I don't give a shit about. I don't care how cold the stadium is. I don't care how cold it is in Orchard Park. I don't think that's going to affect the Bills whatsoever. And weather elements, by the way, so we're clear, I'm talking about affecting the Bills' offense and more specifically their ability to chuck the football around. We, Josh Allen's legs are going to be fine. James Cook's legs are going to be fine. Leonard Fournette, if he plays, Ty Johnson, if he plays, their legs are going to be fine. I'm talking about the ability to spread the football around and toss it, okay? So we're clear on that. But anyway, the cold means nothing to me. Uh, the snow doesn't mean a lot. I'm not going to say nothing, but the snow's not that big of a deal. It could be snowing, potentially even snowing hard. And it could be freezing-ass cold. I don't give a shit. I don't think that's going to affect the Bills' offense whatsoever. But the one element, the, the second greatest equalizer, to me, there's two things. When you're playing, when you're the better team and you're playing an inferior team, and in this case, make no mistake about it, the Bills are the better team. Pittsburgh's the inferior team. There's two elements that will always give the underdog hope. One of them is in your control and the other one isn't. The first and the biggest thing is turnovers. You turn the ball over, you can lose, especially in the NFL. I don't give a shit who you're playing or where you're playing them or what the elements are. So, But you can control that. You don't screw up, don't turn the ball over. But the second thing is weather. To me, weather is the second biggest equalizer in professional football. And they're talking about wind gusts of up to 40 miles an hour. Now, gusts is different than wind. If the wind is 15, 20 miles an hour during the game, uncomfortable, but that's not going to stop Josh Allen from slinging the ball. His arm strength is ridiculous, and he'll still be able to throw the ball relatively fine, even in 15, 20-degree uh, mile-per-hour winds. But when that shit gets up to 40 miles an hour, if it does, and by the way, this forecast that we're seeing is really fluid. I've seen a lot of reports. Some are saying, not some, all are saying that potentially it could get really, really, really shitty. And others are saying there's a chance, especially during the game itself, that it might not end up being that bad at all. But anyway, worst case scenario, that wind's ripping 30 to 40 miles an hour. You know, that, that, that's not good. That's not good for the Buffalo Bills because they could throw the ball better than the Pittsburgh Steelers. They got the better quarterback who throw the football better. And I'd be remiss if I said I didn't at least think about the New England Patriots game a couple of years ago when the wind was just absolutely ridiculous on Monday night. Neither team could throw the football. Mac Jones only threw the football twice. And the Bills lost that game. I think it was, what, 14-3 or 14-9? I don't remember. 14-3, something like that. Now, I will say, I think the Bills are a much better football team than they were a couple of years ago, at least in terms of these elements. I think the Bills are more stout on the defensive line, and I think this offensive line is better than it's been in any of probably the last at least like three or four years. So I'm not saying the Bills are doomed if the weather is terrible, but it does concern me. And the question was, what scares you the most? So long-winded answer there is definitely, uh, is definitely the weather. The weather, the wind more specifically being really bad is a factor that potentially could scare me. Uh, Mazvid says, I worry about the absence of Davis in this game, meaning Gabe Davis. Not only has he proven to be a tough matchup for Pittsburgh's secondary, in past matchups, he's also vital to Buffalo's run game. All right, so Gabe Davis hurt his knee in the first half of the Miami game. As we record this on Thursday, he hasn't been ruled out for Sunday, but he was a full DNP, meaning did not participate in practice both Wednesday and Thursday. Logic probably says at this point he would be uh, unlikely to play. Talking about being a, a, a tough matchup for Pittsburgh's secondary, 2022 
two years ago, not this season, season before, Gabe torched the Steelers. Three catches, 171 yards, two touchdowns. So he had a he had a 98 yard touchdown and he had a 62 yard touchdown. And again, that was back in uh back in 2022. Um, worry about the absence of Davis in this game, maybe a little bit strong, but I'd like to have him in uniform and play for sure. Obviously. I mean, why would you not want him in uniform? He's a starter. He's a guy who's capable of having big games. Look, statistically, at least in terms of catching the football and producing, Gabe Davis has been the uh, textbook photograph for, for hot and cold. He either seems to have a 100-yard game with a touchdown or one catch for seven yards, if he even catches the ball at all. Seems to be like not much in between. There hasn't been a lot of five catches for, for 68 yards out of Gabe Davis. I think the offense passing-wise could be fine. Um, I do agree and like uh, Mazvid's point that Gabe Davis is vital to the Bills running game. Gabe Davis is an excellent and a willing blocker. There was a 14-yard run that James Cook had early in the Miami game that was sprung because Gabe Davis made a block. There was also a short pass to Khalil Shakir that got sprung largely because of a Gabe Davis block. So don't sleep on that. That does matter. Um, Good point. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I worry about the absence a little bit, but, it, it, you know, it's not like... I don't think the Bills' chances plummet or the needle even moves much for this specific game if uh, Gay plays or not, which Greg G has a complete opposite here. He says, I think the Bills are honestly better off without Gabe Davis. I hate to see him hurt, but I think something is off there, although I'm not sure what it is. All right, look, that's a pretty good point too. I still prefer Gabe Davis plays because, again, A, he's had a lot of success against Pittsburgh. B. You never know. He could get you that 100 yards receiving. And, and C, he's a good and willing run blocker. So I agree with the last comment or with the last questions or concerns. But I also see the point here. First of all, Trent Shurfield, when he finally had an opportunity for an extended playing time on Sunday in Miami, came out pretty big. That's a great, great concentration and focus to, to bring in that touchdown on Sunday. It was a big, I mean, every offense play was big, but that was big. And in terms of uh, not being on the same page, you know, that's a really good point too, because I mean, I haven't really had the time or energy to go back and look at all of Josh Allen's interceptions this season yet. And there were a lot of them, but there are definitely, even recently, at least a handful of Josh Allen mistakes where the pass was intended for Gabe Davis. And look, We'll never know. Was it Gabe's fault? Was it Josh's fault? I don't think we'll ever truly know who was at fault on some of these mistakes, these plays that were out there that weren't executed. But what is obvious and what's not debatable is that it does seem that they are at times not on the same page, Josh and Gabe. So sure, man. And like I said, Sherfield is, um, he shows a promise last week. I, I've liked him. So it's another good point there. Cassidy says, I hate hard knocks, but watch this week after Bills beat Miami. Loved it. The body language of the Miami isn't close to what the Bills is. They knew it was a matter of time. Look, I couldn't agree more. I talked about it a little bit with Jerome Baker early on. There's just something different between the Buffalo Bills and Miami Dolphins beyond the skill level of the players like Miami just feels like front runners and I don't watch the hard knocks. So I don't really have this intimate knowledge of Miami beyond watching them on Sundays or whenever they play each week, except for that last episode. And it really, the body language thing strikes me because I, I couldn't agree more. Like even at halftime, Miami went into that. And again, this was the access that you get for watching Hard knocks. So Miami goes in the locker room and they're up 14 7. And they didn't even see that fired up. It's almost like, um, you know, Cassidy refers to the body language. It kind of felt that. It was like, well, what's going to happen? You know, they're talking like, hey, let's go. But I don't know. There's just, 
don't know if it's leadership. I think to some extent, I don't know if it's the coach, maybe it's the quarterback. Which speaking of, I I don't like taking shots at Tua because it just feels like I'm going after the low hanging fruit here as a Bills fan. Because I like Tua just fine. I think he, I don't think he's a great quarterback. He's certainly not an elite one in my opinion, even no matter what his stats say. But he's a pretty good quarterback. He's a hell of a guy. I like him. I, I root for I root for people like that. But he doesn't have command in that locker room. And that shit was obvious watching that. And I think that's a big factor. You know, Josh Allen is the alpha of the Buffalo Bills. He's the leader. They have lots of captains, but this is Josh Allen's football team. Josh Allen's going to get loud in that locker room, I'm sure. And people are going to listen to him. They're going to follow him. And I don't buy that with Tua whatsoever, especially after watching Hard Knocks this past week. You know, he's talking up a little bit and guys are half ignoring him. Imagine Trent Sherfield or Dawson Knox or Dalton Kincaid kind of blowing off whatever Josh Allen's saying. You ain't going to see that shit, man. So it's that. It's coaching. It's a combination of things. Miami's got a ton of talent. Again, they, they're, shit, they scored 70 points on Denver this year. They run over shit teams. But at this point now, it's not, it can't be a coincidence anymore. They've lost to the Bills twice. The, the first game was a complete blowout. They got curb stomped in a game that they really needed to win in Baltimore to secure so to make the Buffalo game not even matter this final week. Actually, if they were to beat Baltimore, they could have been the number one seed if they beat the Bills. So they have plenty to play for, and they got fucking shellacked by Baltimore. They don't play well against good football teams. They beat Dallas. That's the only good team they beat all year, and they barely beat Dallas. There's got to be a reason. Again, I just don't think they have that grit, that, that, that dog in them, and leadership, and coaching. McDaniel's a hell of a guru. He tells us some sweet ass plays, some sweet looks, some sweet motions. I love watching the Miami offense. They're fun. They're fun to watch. But I just don't see it, man. I just, there's something that's missing in Miami. And to the point that Cassidy made, the body language for the Miami Dolphins, if I'm a Miami Dolphins fan, I, I would see it coming too. Just looked like they were waiting for the Bills to take over. Again, I said it big brother, little brother. That's what Buffalo and Miami are uh, at this point. Dan W. says, I think the Bills keep winning in spite of McDermott, not because of him, but in spite of him. Horrible in-game judgment. I can make an argument that he costs us two to three games um, this year. All right, well, I'll be fair about this comment, okay? Uh, I can make a great argument that he costs us two, three games this year. That's not wrong. That part, I think, is right. Sean McDermott, to me, cost them the Denver game 100%. I put that on Sean McDermott. Uh, I could, you can make a case that, hmm, thinking now <laughs> as we're going along. The New England game. I think Sean McDermott cost them the New England game too. So there's, there's, there, there's your two games right there. I was thinking Jets in my mind as I was talking opening week. But honestly, that wasn't Sean McDermott, man. The defense played fine. Offensive play calls were fine. It was jo Josh Allen had one of the worst games of his career. Josh Allen cost them the Jets game. Um, I don't know who's responsible for the travel in London, but that sluggish ass start. I don't know if that's Sean. I don't know if that's an organizational thing. We'll put him on that. But I will give him, I'll give you Denver for sure. You know what? I'll give you, I, I'll even give you Philly too. I think scared coaching. In fact, Philly might even be the first choice here. Scared coaching probably cost them huge against Philly. No adjustments in the second half defensively at all. Not going forward on fourth down and overtime. Bad timeout management. Lots of things. Not trying to score when you could have had the ball with 20 seconds left in the timeout with Josh Allen. So I'll give you that on Sean. That said, you, you lose me. You lose me when you say the Bills keep winning in spite of McDermott because that, that I don't buy. I think since the buy, and sounds like a broken record on this podcast, maybe some others, bringing up the Tyler Dunn series on Sean McDermott. But to me, I bring it up because it's indisputable to me that no matter how you felt about that series, fair, unfair, well-written, hit piece, as some people call it, whatever you want to call it, the one thing 
to me that nobody can deny is that this team has rallied around Sean McDermott since then. How much the article itself had to do with it, the series, maybe we could debate that. But since the bye week, since that drop, since Sean McDermott had to have the press conference to address the 9-11 speech or pep talk, whatever you want to call it in training camp, a couple of years ago, this team has rallied around him. We saw it in Kansas City, in the locker room, the emotion after the Bills won that game, Brandon Bean giving him a game ball, Terry Bagula there smiling, players getting hyped for him. You can hear it, you can see it, you can feel it. So I don't buy that shit. Plus, I think Sean McDermott has been amazing over this last month. This offense has been more aggressive. Josh Allen's using his legs a lot more. And I don't care what you say. I don't care if it's Dorsey. I don't care if it's Joe Brady. I don't care if it's Ted Marchabrota. I don't care if Andy Reeves, the offensive coordinator. Josh Allen's not going to run the football as much as he has been if the head coach doesn't sign off on it. Period. End of story. He's been more aggressive. He went for it on fourth down twice with the lead late on the road. Not something he would normally do, but he did that in Miami. So he's been a lot more aggressive offensively. He's been way more aggressive on the defensive side, and this defense is closing out football games. They're closing out games. So I, I can't get behind that at all. I think Sean McDermott over the last five weeks has been as good as anybody in the NFL with coaching. And in the support of his players. And again, I talked about Jerome Baker's stupid ass tweet. I promise you, a Bills linebacker ain't making that tweet. Nobody in the Bills is making that, that dumb tweet with Sean McDermott as the head coach. So I don't know, man. I, I, I don't buy that part at all. At all. Blakeford, do you think Linval Joseph plays? Not sure if, been, if we've been resting him or what, but I feel like we could really use him this week. You know, that's a really good question. A really good point, too. So Puna Ford has been in the lineup for the last since Daquan Jones came back. The Bills, instead of going with Linval Joseph, have went with Puna Ford. With also Jordan Phillips hurt, by the way. So the rotation's been Jones with Ed Oliver, and there's been Puna Ford and Tim Settle, four defensive tackles. Linval Joseph, the last couple of weeks, been the odd man out. There's a school of thought, one that I would seriously consider that. You're playing the Pittsburgh Steelers team this Sunday that is desperately going to try to sustain long possessions, keep Josh Allen off the field, and going to try to run the football and be very physical, probably between the tackles. That being the case, Lamal Joseph playing would make a lot of sense. Lamal Joseph is a big boy. He's a huge boy. If something were to happen at Daquan Jones, who's looked really good, by the way, in the two games that he's been back. But if he gets dinged up, you want Linval Joseph there. I think Linval Joseph is a more stout, one gap, one tech, I should say, run defender who will, you know, clog up lanes and take on blockers, I think, more than Puna Ford. Whereas I think Puna Ford has a little bit more uh, versatility and range to him. Not a lot, but more than Linval Joseph, which, by the way, that Deontay Hardy punt return, Puna Ford had a nice block. Or at least getting out to the punter to slow him down. So that's not lost on, I'm sure it's not lost on the coaching staff either as a special teams contributor. But um, look, for Linval Joseph to play on Sunday, that would mean that either A, Puna Ford, or Tim Settle, but I don't see it. Tim Settle hasn't sat once this year, so I don't see it happening now in the playoffs. So it would probably be Ford. So if Linval Joseph plays, that means either A, Puna Ford is out, or B, Instead of going with five defensive ends, like the Bills have pretty much all season long, they would only go with four, which in that case, it would mean Vaughn Miller sitting. Because again, even if they, you know, Vaughn Miller sat a couple of weeks ago and the Bills just elevated Kingsley Jonathan and they still only went with five ends and four uh, tackles. Bills dressed nine linemen for the game and it's been five ends, four tackles. So will the Bills sit Vaughn Miller? I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, Vaughn, say what you will about him, and I've said a lot, but the fact that he was on the field for the last three snaps on the Bills' final defensive series, that uh, Taylor Rapp got an interception on the seal of the game in Miami, that tells me if he's on the field at the end and A.J. Vanessa wasn't, that tells me that they're not planning on making Vaughn Miller inactive. So that's five ends right there. So I only, 
if they if they uh, scratch Buda Ford, which, by the way, I'd be very open to. In fact, if it was me making a decision in this game, based on the opponent, I probably would dress Joseph and scratch Buda Ford. Now, if you're playing a team like Houston with, Mark, with C.J. Stroud, your quarterback, you're going to spray the football around, then give me Puna in that case, if Jordan Phillips isn't back. Good question or point, I should say. Um, you know what? Before I get to this, I- I'm going to read this because this was too long to be able to fit on the screen. It's from my buddy on Facebook, Ron Anderson. It's about Josh Allen. Not going to give a long, detailed answer, but I feel like this is worth at least mentioning to y'all. He says, how could anyone question Josh Allen's turnovers when over the last four years he has converted more third downs than any team in the NFL, has more wins than 31 other teams, has at one point held the record for most pass attempts in the red zone without a turnover, has led the league or been ranked top five for four years in red zone percentage ending in the TD to have more touchdowns than any other player in their first six years in NFL history, and that he's done it all with three different OCs. Played half the year last year with an injured elbow that other quarterbacks would have missed and currently has the NFL Ironman streak. He's ranked second in 2020, ranked third in 2021, ranked second in 2022, and this year ranked sixth in scoring per game. He makes plays and goes God mode and makes plays that other people can't make, but he isn't perfect. You can't expect him to make the God play all the time without there being some risk involved. I also want to throw in a stat that on about six of his interceptions, the opponent was pinned within their own 20-yard line. Even with everything Josh went through this year, with his turnovers, if we don't have 12 guys on the field versus Denver, if A.J. Brown doesn't fumble, or if it is a fumble, we are tied for the number one seed, and he is a unanimous MVP. Two plays that have nothing to do with him determine whether or not he is the MVP. All right, not going to get into because, you know, time permitting here, I don't want to be here all day. And Josh Allen's a fascinating topic. He always is. And we could talk for him about hours. Everything he's, everything Ron said is right. I think Josh Allen, Matt Perino said it a couple of weeks ago, and I don't disagree with him. Matt Perino said he thinks Josh Allen's the best player in the NFL. He thinks that if you're starting an NFL team right now, that he would be the first overall pick, even before Patrick Mahomes, because of the things that he can already do and because of the things mentally that he still has the capability to grow from. So Ron made a lot of great points statistically. Ron made a lot of great points that were not for two plays, were not for Denver having 12 or Buffalo having 12 guys on the field against Denver. If in that Philly game, A.J. Brown was close to a fumble, that's called a fumble, the Bills win the game. You give the Bills those two wins, they get the number one seed. Josh Allen is your easy MVP, not Lamar Jackson. I agree with all that. But here's the one thing I will say. His very first sentence, literally, of that statement says, I don't understand how people could still question Josh's turnovers. Well, because there's some really bad turnovers. That's why. Josh Allen, as great as he is, as superhuman as he is, as much as he's counted on, Josh Allen from time to time has made some awful, awful mistakes. Some bad decisions, some bad throws, big mistakes. So, I can agree with everything that Ron's saying about it. And trust me, this is my guy, man. Ron's a friend of mine. And I see his Facebook during the game. He's constantly defending Josh. And he takes it really personal when people criticize him because he's looking in the lens of the other 31 quarterbacks in comparison to Josh, which is correct. But you can't question as good as Josh is. He's had some really bad, bad turnovers and a couple bad games. I mean, he was terrible against the Jets. I mean, it was all the way back in week one, but it was bad. Good point, so I, I like that. Let me get to the, the last few here. Um, actually, that's it for the Bills. A couple more here. Uh, Burden, why don't you discuss the Sabres more on the podcast? This feels like it's becoming a complete Buffalo Bills podcast. More Sabres talk. Um, the Buffalo Sabres stink, and, and they're annoying. They're frustrating, and maybe, most importantly to me right now, they're not very likable. That's how I feel about the team right now. Look, they're at the halfway point of the season, and they've had a winning streak of more than one game twice. One of them just this past week. And then they take that two-game winning streak, start a critical 
six game homestand and, and they lose five to two to Seattle on their home ice. It's frustrating, man. All the expectations on this team and all the great things that were written and said about them. And honestly, they've shit themselves this year. They're not ready for these expectations. Uh, now, I know you're not asking me for my opinion on the Sabres. You're asking me why, don't, why I don't discuss them more. And that's a very fair point. The only thing I'll say is this. The Bills are dominating right now. This is money time for, for football. Okay, most people who are listening to the show or watching the show right now, at least anyway, they care about the Bills. I promise you this, good, bad, or ugly, I will definitely be picking up uh, the Sabres talk when, when the Bills season ends. You know, I have done a couple Sabres episodes. Uh, I've had PK out for the Buffalo Sports Collective. Actually, we've done a couple of live shows immediately after a couple of Sabres games. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I lack on coverage. I'm, I'm not going to sit there. I'm not going to lie to you. Part of the reason, too, is I used to have my man Joe Yurden, and I don't have as many hockey guys as I do football guys, but um, I used to have Joe Yurden on pretty much every week. And Joe obviously covers the Sabres, but now Joe's really busy covering the Sabres and other projects, so it's rare that I get him on. That used to be my sit back and chill, let you know, Joe do all the work and provide us with some good Sabres content here. But uh, that's one way. But anyway, Good question, fair point, and I, and I promise you this: when the save, when the bill season's over, which hopefully ain't going to be for another handful of weeks, then uh, we will definitely start giving uh, the Sabers more coverage. Oh, uh, thanks for the comment, Vernon. All right, Katie Carlson, last couple here: build an offensive line using only sitcom dads. Can be cartoon or live action. All right, this is fun, this is entertaining, and I will say this too: I only got this question from uh, from Katie Carlson. Uh, a couple hours before, and I've been doing other stuff. So I really didn't put a lot of thought into this. If you have something that I don't mention, by all means, please throw it in the comments or, or tweet at me, email me, whatever. I, I, I'd like to know what you guys think. Um, off of the line, TV sitcom dads. Again, very, very little thought. These are pretty much just ones that popped in my head quickly. Left tackle, I'm going with Uncle Phil from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Good size. Looks like a, a guy who can move around, kind of has that Deion Dawkins kind of vibe to me. So left tackle for me was easy. I'm going to go with Uncle Phil. Left guard, you want some beef in there? I went with Dan Connor uh, from Roseanne, Roseanne's husband or former husband. Did they get divorced? Did she? I know she left the show, or was forced out of the show. I don't know how they rid her off or whatever. So I don't know if they were still married or she died or whatever. But anyway, my answer is Dan Connor, man. Big boy. Get some solid beef there um, at the guard position. My center, I'm going to go back to the 90s. Family Matters. Carl Winslow, the dad. You said TV sitcom's dad. Um, I can see him anchoring the line. Intelligent player. Nice guy. Mitch Morsey. Uh, kind of vibes to him. Big enough. So I'll go with Carl Winslow. Right guard. I'll go, he's a little he's short, but he's big. Tony, I'm going to go with Tony Soprano, man. Tony Soprano. Now, despite what Uncle Junior says, that he never had the makings of a, a varsity athlete, I disagree. And I think Tony Soprano could do a good job playing guard. So I got that interior with Dan Connor and Carl Winslow, Tony Soprano. Feeling pretty good about that. Maybe may be able to contain uh, some defensive tackles there. And then right tackle. I don't know why this one popped in my mind, but it did. And this is easily the best one on the line. I'm going with George Papadopoulos. And some of you younger people who are listening or watching might be like, who in the fuck is George Papadopoulos? He was on the TV show Webster back in the 80s. One of my favorite shows, by the way, when I was a little kid. He was uh, Webster's adoptive father. And in real life, he was played by Eric Carroll, who was a four-time pro bowler for the Detroit Lions. Now, in real life, Alex Karras was a defensive tackle. But since we're talking TV sitcom dads, I could easily flip his ass. Plus, his name's not Alex Karras. Now his name is George Papadopoulos. And he is my uh, <laughs> he's my starting right tackle there. So that was fun. Good question. Thanks, Katie Carlson. Uh, Lemire, best classic TV comedy that was always great for a laugh. All right, well, See, here's the thing. For me, classic means old. 
you know, I think a classic, that means sitcom, that means studio audience, the laugh tracks, you know, the, the clapping. To me, that's classic. That's old. So like anything, and some of you might disagree, and that's fair. But like anything like 90s or newer, just it, 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 more recent, I can't call those classics. So I got to go being a kid. I got to go like 80s or before. And for that reason, I'm going to go with Three's Company. That was, as a kid, probably one show that I can remember that I was always laughing at. Jack Tripper was freaking hilarious. And that was the TV show where there would always be some kind of misunderstanding where two people would be in a room and they're talking about something and then somebody would come in or be in the other room and they would hear something and they would think of something else. It was just always these crazy situations. Jack Tripper was just a funny ass freaking dude, man. Uh, plus I love Janet as well. That show. I always laughed. The Ropers, Ralph Furley, so many great Larry, so many great, the, the Gigolo Larry, so many great supporting characters in that show. Just a, a hilarious show. And for me, that's classic. Like I said, some people might go with more recent shows, you know, even 15, 20 years ago. But to me, that's not classic. I think a classic of being a kid. So I'm going to go with, uh, with, with Three's Company there. I don't know mention, by the way. I could have went with the Jeffersons just as easy. That show was fucking hilarious. And uh, Family Ties. Family Ties was one of my favorite shows, too. And plus, it was, it, was, uh, it was really funny here. All right, last question. We're going to get out of here. CF, at CF Maz says, since moving back to Buffalo, what has been the biggest change you have experienced after living in Florida for some time? Sports, food, Buffalo culture, et cetera. All right, this is a, this is a, a really good question here. And... For a little bit of context for people who don't know, I am Buffalo born and raised, lived in Buffalo my entire life until 2016, 2016. Then I moved to uh, Bradenton, Florida, right near Sarasota. And I lived in Florida for about five and a half years before returning to Buffalo late summer uh, 2021, where I've been back since. So about five and a half years in Florida. Anyway, it's a good question. Uh, the biggest change has been understanding that Buffalo and Florida, Buffalo is not any better than Florida to me. Buffalo is not any worse than Florida to me. Buffalo is just worlds apart different. Living in Buffalo or living in Sarasota, Florida are just completely uh, different worlds. So I guess the biggest change is just how different everything is. And I think you don't realize that if you live in just one place, like when I lived in Buffalo for all the years I did, a lot of the things, whether they were good things, if they were good things, I think you, you take some of them for granted, food, et cetera, I can go on and on. If they're bad things, you don't even realize they're that bad because you haven't lived anywhere else to know any better. So the culture is just different. And that's why I've always felt, not always, but in recent years, especially after doing it, I have felt that to really experience something or to know something, you got to be somewhere else as well. Because otherwise you just good, bad, or indifferent. You just don't know any better. You know, there's things about Buffalo right now that I think are way better than when I lived in Florida. Home, yeah. First of all, I feel home. I know, I know the place inside out. Um, it's familiar, it's comfortable, the food in Buffalo, especially like pizza, wings, things that I like, subs, a lot of different fin chicken fingers, things like that. No contest is Buffalo, tight knit neighborhoods, you know, little, little Johnny around the corner in, in South Buffalo or, or the West side, wherever you may be, he's on a travel hockey team or baseball team. And his team's got to raise money and they're going to have a fundraiser or somebody gets sick in your neighborhood and they have a, a benefit party. That whole neighborhood showing out. They're coming. They're supporting you. Buffalo is incredible for having tight knit communities that really help and support each other. And again, when you live here your whole life, I think to some extent, at least, at least sometimes, no, no, not everybody, but most people, you just take stuff like that for granted. You really do. Um, it's easy to get around here in Buffalo. 
There's a hundred different ways to get to somewhere. In Florida, it's not the case. Traffic. Traffic's nothing here. It can be annoying, but if you if you don't know any better and you want to know annoying, try going uh on the on the 275 to get to Florida, to get to Tampa, please. Or the I-4 going towards Orlando. Then, and then you'll learn what traffic uh really is. So that's great things about Buffalo. But the shit about Buffalo, I can't stand. I hate winter. This weather sucks. I hate winter. It just feels gloomier. Uh, not a lot of changes in Buffalo. Not much changes. And if you don't like going out to eat, and you, especially if you don't like drinking, Buffalo can get boring, man. Again, Florida's great in some ways. Sunshine's beautiful. It really is. The beaches, they're gorgeous. Water, the scene, the vibes, the palm trees. It just feels different. You just... You feel more relaxed and you can't help but be in a better mood when you're around sunshine and water and palm trees and beaches all the time. It matters. I, I really do. I, I think it matters on your psyche. Um, people are a lot easier going there. Again, very chill vibes for the most part in Florida. There's always shit to do. Always things to do. So many things. Million and one golf courses. A million and one amusement parks. So many things. Top golf. There's probably every restaurant. If if food's your thing, even if you don't, you know, even if the food's not as good, every chain, every place you could think of has a location in Florida, man. Um, you just got there's everything to do there. But then you look on the other side, traffic blows in Florida. It's terrible, man. And there aren't communities, it's to each their own. You know, when you live, when I moved to Florida, I uh we moved into a complex. And it was cool in a way because it was so easy to fit in. Like, it didn't feel strange. And then I realized soon after it's because, well, fucking nobody's from Florida. Everyone in that complex was from somewhere else. Pennsylvania, Chicago, Texas, Virginia. Everybody's a transplant. Everybody's from somewhere else. So it's easy to feel like you're fitting in. But at the same token, you don't have that long-term equity with people. You don't really know them. They don't know you. They really don't give a shit. Kind of keep to themselves for the most part. Now there's exceptions. You know, my wife and I and my son, we were very fortunate. We got hooked up with, uh, I don't remember how it happened, but this MVP group in Sarasota, Bradenton. And it resulted in, well, at least my wife anyway, because I don't do shit, but playing volleyball and softball and some other stuff and just it's a sports and social group and just made so many really, really good friends. Miss them to this day too. Um, but for the most part, them aside, Florida's just a lot more to yourself. Like I said, the traffic sucks. There's no real sense of community. So I don't know. In terms of being back, I, I kind of, to be honest with you, man, I feel like I'm like on a little bit of a, uh, a trial period right now. Not that I have intentions on moving back to Florida, but I haven't completely closed the door on it. But anyway, to answer the question, in terms of feeling different, it's everything, man. It's just It's just so, so different. Anyway, all right, that's going to do it for this episode. Wow, I'm one almost in a full hour yapping by myself. Well, that's what happens when they get some pretty good questions uh, like we got today. Anyway, last point. You're hearing this Friday. I just heard that if the weather gets like horrifically bad on Sunday and they declare a state of emergency. It's possible from what I've seen on Twitter that this game potentially could actually get moved to like Cleveland. So let's hope that that doesn't happen. Let's hope mother nature, you know, you're going to give us a beating. We'll take some of those lashes, but just keep the wind down. Let it snow. Let it be two degrees out. I don't give a shit, but those 40 mile an hour potential winds, Keep that shit away, man. Keep that shit away. And I feel like if you do, I'd be willing to bet good money, and I will, that I will be coming on live sometime maybe 20 minutes to 60 minutes after the 1 p.m. game on Sunday talking about a Bills divisional round matchup against either Kansas City, Houston, or Cleveland. And here's a spoiler alert, folks. It's going to be Kansas City. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Have a good weekend. Good luck to the Buffalo Bills.